Thank you very much, David. Um, I hope you can hear and, and see me fine. Um, I'm really sorry, first of all, uh, that I couldn't come in person to Paris. I would have loved to join you really uh, being there and answering questions and so on. I know how it is to sit uh, on a Friday afternoon at, at your chairs. So um, I think it's always nice to have people actually really there also in, in person. But um, I have a small daughter, so with her, it was, it was really difficult to organize the logistics. Plus now with the winter weather, um, that's a bit difficult. But in any case, I hope we can have a good discussion. So please, uh, if you uh, if you have questions or whatever, I'm, I'm super happy to answer everything. Um, and also, I mean, already during the presentation, or we can also keep it uh, for for afterwards as you prefer. Maybe I can give a bit of, of background. I mean, uh, David already uh, already shared with you an introduction. So I was indeed I graduated 2015 um, from from the EPOC cohort. Um, and I was major A, but um, I had a background before I came to EPOC um, in business administration, spe uh, yeah, specialized on banking and finance. So I was also maybe not the typical um, cohort A student, um, which means that also then after my year in Torino or in Italy for the first year, I kind of came back a bit with the interest towards central banks and finance and banking, um, and actually also really much the role of public institutions. Um, and that's exactly what I, I learned a lot uh, in the in the courses uh, in Paris, and then I did my thesis um, at at UMass Amherst in the in the United States, also related to central banks and um, and their role on financial stability. So actually, that kind of closes almost the loop because I came from the private sector um, uh, banking industry basically before EPOG, and then I learned really of the importance of, of regulation, what role public institutions can play, and so on. Um, and then I said after EPOC, well, let's see honestly how public institutions work. Um, and I applied to the to the ECB uh, to just for a traineeship um, to see how things go and if I like it as well, because a public institution is also, um, I mean, quite different than if you work in the private sector. Um, and I was, I think, in the time, really lucky because I joined the ECB in a moment when um, it was um, the SSM, which I will talk about today also. Um, was very much in the making. I mean, uh, the ECB has the mandate to, to supervise banks in 2014. So I joined there in 2017, which also means now I'm about yeah, six years um, into the job. And that um, means also that uh, in the time, it was just really interesting because it was a bit of startup phase. There were a lot of new things. So I've seen um, quite an interesting progress also how supervision evolved over the last years and we are celebrating this year really the 10 years of, of banking supervision at the European level um, which is also a great milestone um, for I think for let's say banking supervision but also overall of, for financial stability in, in the European or in the Eurozone. Um, so that much about me maybe I'm um, privately so I, I married actually in 2018 already and then um, and I, my daughter was born two years ago almost um, and we live in Frankfurt since I, I work here um, at the central bank. Then let me um, start so I would like to talk to you about today um, about really the functioning of the SSM so the single supervisory mechanism as we have it in place um, for banking supervision in the euro area um, and touch upon um, first of all, why banking supervision is important. I think there are probably not too many news for you, especially people doing um, the um, track B. So the people who already have a background in, in finance or in uh, yeah banking industry. Um, but anyway, since I know you have multiple different backgrounds, also people coming from other areas, um, I thought it's good to start also with some basics um, and then um, speak about really banking union. What, so what does this mean? Um, how far are we there? what mandate we have um, in the single supervisory mechanism um, and how that really goes. So actually um, talking very much on, on how does this work on day-to-day -day practice. I brought um, two topics um, of supervision. They were not included in the slide deck before, so I just um, actually added them um, because I wanted Dorine, to give you a bit of more. Yeah, Dorine, let's say maybe very... you can put it full screen. I don't know. Mm, can I put, yeah, yeah I guess. See, uh -huh. There. Do you see it better now? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, 
Then, uh, exactly, these two topics on data aggregation and climate, actually, which are two topics very close to my heart that I'm working on every day, and that are also two um, topics of, of priorities for, um, the, for the SSM overall. So in terms of how we do supervision, what do we even look at um, when we supervise banks? And those are two important topics um, where I will talk a little bit more on um, yeah, what are the expectations, what do we do with the banks, and, and where do we stand there? And last but not least, um, I thought maybe interesting also for you to have a bit of background uh, on, on how a traineeship looks like, or if you are interested uh, in, in getting into the ECB or having an experience um, at the institution to just give you some insights how that could work or what would be a possible path uh, there. Um, so why is it so important to supervise banks? Um, I think, I mean, uh, from our or for my generation some time ago it was still a bit more present because we were really at the time really experienced um i think the financial crisis in 2008-9 firsthand but um also for you i think in many courses probably you've, you've talked about it because many consequences and a lot of things that are in place still today um really were put in place because of this crisis um and um what happened uh, to the financial industry in, in eight nine, um, really where we could see that banks were struggling or were close to bankruptcy or even went into bankruptcy. But we saw on many areas, um, we saw it in the US, but also, of course, on the European side, um, that banks were bailed out, um, that they were helped, that capital was put into the banks, that they were either bought or partially and then um, yeah, brought under govern government control. Um, in order to stabilize the banks, in order to stabilize the financial system. And um, I think that is one of the main drivers or lessons learned, um, because what we can see there is that when governments step in to, to help banks or help um, yeah, financial institutions, that also, of course, has a, an, an overall impact. Because, I mean, what is used essentially here is taxpayer money. Um, and that taxpayer money, uh, in the end, uh, limits then is not available for other things um, and can limit a government um, in order to support. So I think it is really a conjunction of, of different things. I mean, on one hand, you have a financial crisis where the government helps. At the same time, the government is also in the role to, um, of course, yeah, help the, the population and maybe alleviate a little bit the um, the recession or uh, certain downturns that happen due to this anywhere in the economy. And what you could see um, also in the time uh, back then is that really um, there was an impact on poverty rates, on people immigrating from countries, especially Ireland was, was quite severely hit um, in terms of from the financial industry. So that really had an impact on the economy. And, and that's also really on people and on their everyday life. Um, I think the situation in Spain um, has been really difficult as well. So um, those are kind of all reasons why it is actually in the public interest to, um, to really say, we need to keep an eye on the financial industry and what is going on there. Mm. If we, if we look at that, um, we can also see the impact on prices um, on really output levels. So you do have an impact when you have um, different crises, for example, um, uh, epidemics, but also embargoes, wars, or, or financial, um, yeah, uh, financial crises. Um, you could really see that the difference, for example, for financial crises, um, the impact um, in terms of output downturn really is long lasting. So these are um, investigations here and research done um, by the by the ECB and uh, you can really see that even in the course of eight years after a financial crisis you still have a lower output um, than uh, than before so it's also not so easy to simply recover the economy uh, very quickly after after such a downturn um, so they are really long lasting uh, long lasting impacts I think that's the main message um, Second point um, is, uh, is very much that banks are just really different than other companies. Um, and uh, that is on one hand, of course, the macroeconomic functions that they fulfill in terms of granting credit, transferring payments, so everything that they do in order to have the, make the economy run. Not telling you anything new there, I think. Um, at the same time, they're having people's savings um, and um, they have the, uh, disproportionately a very high leverage ratio, which is simply the fact of how banks operate. Um, they have a, a very low equity um, and really leverage on that low equity in order to give out funds. Um, and, and by that, 
make their money. I mean, that is part of the business model. So you can see here on the right hand side, a little bit of comparison, maybe with other big companies um, like Volkswagen, uh, Total Energies or Siemens um, that have a much, much higher equity to assets ratio than uh, big banks uh, like BNP Paribas, Deutsche Bank or ING. Um, and they are, um, yeah, therefore, they are, if things, if they are hit by any crisis or any problems, um, of course, there's much less capital available equity available in order to um, stabilize the bank again. Mm, that's really different. So that means we had, um, I mean, we already had banking regulation, of course, and we had uh, a lot of rules for banks in place uh, before 2008, where the first Basel actually from 1988. I remember in the course from, from, uh, from Robert Goodman that I also took in the EPOC uh, program and we also talked about banking regulation and exactly these times so maybe for, to some of you um, you already know like some much more details than than I will provide you today but I want to give you like let's say the bigger picture on saying oh, there is has been banking regulation already before but it was very light very much the same for all banks um, with Basel II, there, there was already an update trying to make really a bit more difference between different um, size of banks as well. Um, but with Basel III basically put in place 2010, taking the lessons learned from the financial crisis, um, really an effort was made to say, we need to step up our game and we need to make a difference also, especially on the asset side of banks um, to, uh, to make sure that the diff different assets are accounted for the different risks that they are posing on the balance sheet and that the capital the banks are required to hold are in line with the risks that they are taking. So I think there in terms of regulation, of course, there's also something called like Basel IV, um, which is kind of the next step over after uh, Basel III, or you can also call it a Basel III refinement, or, um, where more Play, rules are in place or basically where things are um, being a bit more con made concrete and some of the freedom given to banks in terms of own model building and so on is taking actually back a little bit more because um, it was recognized that sometimes it's also too complicated and that's actually the data is not really there in order to really build good internal models um, for, for risk calculation from the bank side. So there this more this tendency towards a standardization again um, for for banks and 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 rather giving them a bit less freedom. Um, important also, I mean, we're still on this. Why why is it important? Also, why are banks so important? How's the situation in in Europe? I mean, especially here, um, if we compare to the United States, um, we have much higher dependency on bank credit to um, to non financial corporate sector, which means our companies in Europe are essentially very dependent on bank financing. They go much less to the capital market in order to get funds um, than, than in the US. Therefore, banks also are much more important here for the, if you want so, real economy, for the overall economy, um, in order to ensure that companies have access to funding um, in order to, to finance investment uh, and so on. Therefore, all these things as a conclusion um, are, are really important to, uh, to have banking regulation um, and to look at them to see what they're doing. So what we had is basically what is the banking union? Um, I mean, the banking union at the, uh, at, in the essence are, are two, two things. It is on one hand the SSM, so the single supervisory rec mechanism, but also the single resolution mechanism. Um, and both are there. One is really um, the SSM is really focusing on the going concern. So really, what is the current state? What are the risks to the banks at the moment that we need to ensure that they have enough capital for? And resolution, the resolution mechanism and the single resolution board, which sits in Brussels, um, they step in in the moment really when, uh, when resolution is effective. So when a bank gets to the point that they are failing or they're likely to fail. Um, and then the processes that they have set and um, yeah, established and that they have put on paper. So there's a lot of <laughs> paper already being prepared in case a specific bank becomes um, failing or likely to fail, that they will, um, that they will be resolved. Um, this is basically do these two things. Um, we call, um, yeah, we call a, the, um, the banking union. Um, it is all Euro countries, of course, um, that are under, under the, the supervisory mechanism. Um, so uh, also 
the country, yeah, all countries that have the euro and the countries that are part of the European Union, um, we have very close cooperation with them. And um, so with those countries, we also take decisions together. Um, and um, I can share or say a few more words also, if you're interested in this uh, afterwards on the, on the cooperation across the different countries in Europe. Um, what does that mean specific for the ECB? I mean, the ECB has been in place ever since we have the euro. And of course, they're responsible for monetary policy on one hand. Um, however, in 2014, they got the new mandate to do banking supervision. So essentially, we have two mandates, um, like to ensure um, a stable currency. And on the other hand, to ensure um, stability of the financial system via supervising the significant institutions. Um, means, however, also though um, within the institution, within the ECB, these two mandates are very separate. Um, they're very, um, I mean, we have a, a separate supervisory board. So also in terms of how the governance is set up and decisions are taking, uh, taken. I mean, there's, um, of course, on the ECB side, there's the governing council that takes the decisions with, um, with the ECB representatives and the um, governors from the different national banks, but on the other hand, um, for the SSM, there's a supervisory board with also representatives from all the national competent authorities and then also representatives from the ECB side. Um, and they're taking the decisions on supervision, completely independent. Um, and um, also what we have, I mean, really this is I don't know if you want to call it Chinese walls, but it's really in the sense of in terms of data exchange and communication. Of course, I can talk to go talk to the colleagues um, uh, working on on the monetary policy side, but um, it's not so easy to get access to data and to um, really exchange uh, information. So it's almost like if you would talk to an outside party um, in terms of organization. Also, uh, building wise, I mean, that's what you see, we really sit in different buildings. If you ever come to Frankfurt, also, maybe uh, if, if any of you ever comes to Frankfurt and would like to have tour to the European Central Bank or see anything also from inside, feel free to get in touch with me. Because what you see also on the left hand side, I mean, that's the really the new building that was uh, inaugurated in 2014 as well. And then on the right hand side, that's the old Euro Tower, more in the city center. Um, and that's where the supervision um, colleagues are sitting. So also uh, physically, we're very much uh, separate. Um, the SSM works the way that, of course, there's the European Central Bank. Um, we do the direct supervision, but in very, very close cooperation um, with the national competent authorities. And those are the 21 central banks. Um, in many countries, um, the competent authority also means that um, there's also another authority. For example, in Germany, um, there is the Bundesbank, of course, but there's also BaFin, which is an authority close to the Ministry of Finance. And they're also responsible for supervision in Germany. So therefore, we're working together with both of those institutions. You have the same in Austria um, with uh, FINMA and the ÖNB. Um, in Spain, for example, is the Banco de España. Um, at Dien or at, uh, in the Netherlands, the the Dutch National Bank, um, which you see here on the bottom. Um, uh, so it really depends on the national setup, how supervision is organized on a national level. Uh, with those authorities, we then also work together, and that working together really means uh, very very close communication and very close uh, cooperation. Effectively, it does not matter. I mean, I will spend a few words also in, in what team I work and how I do this. Um, but effectively, it really doesn't matter if you actually sit at the ECB or if you sit with one of the of the national competent authorities. And that makes it makes it very interesting because it's a bit like lived European integration in in in, in like everyday everyday work life. Um, here, I, this is again a little bit what I referred to before, the SSM is part of the banking union, so you have these two pillars on um, really supervision on a going concern um, and supervision on a gone concern, so going really what is currently ongoing, what the situation of the bank is, and um, uh, gone concern in, in terms of looking at what um, when resolution might have to come in place, and then we also have the single resolution fund and the single resolution board that kick in here. Um, the mandate overall of the um, of the SSM is ensure, and I, I already said that, ensure the safety and soundness of the European banking sector, financial integration and stability. So really to get to the point that, and I think we are not fully there, I mean, we don't have full integration of, of the financial services in Europe yet. We have many banks working across borders, across countries. 
um, but it is not so easy also sometimes to, to transfer funds from one side or from one country to another. So that's one of the tasks or one of the ambitions we have um, uh, for in the SSM. And very important to ensure a consistent supervision, which is one of the lessons learned from the crisis where we really saw before. I mean, if you think about a bank like Deutsche um, that work globally and they work in different European countries, if every European country does supervision of the business in that country, nobody has the full picture of the bank. Um, and therefore nobody could can see fully and assess full, completely the risks that it, that bank is holding or running. Um, and it, that means uh, we really want to ensure that the approach to supervision, how we do it, um, is, is very consistent across the different countries. Because also before you would see a different national institution or different national competent authorities, different focuses. Um, like some were very much focused on, for example, working more on site and having very close cooperation to the bank. Some were very focused on, on doing more things off site via decisions or via in the imposition, also maybe, for example, of sanctions. Um, depending a little bit on culture, uh, so really like national culture, but also supervisory culture, these approaches were very different. Um, and we can to be very honest, we can still see this also sometimes today in terms of the colleagues that I'm working with, what a little bit their preferred way of, of working or supervising is. Um, and uh, But because, of course, I mean, it was ensured that our senior management um, and so on are very much representing all different countries. Um, I think the mainly the first five years were very much focused on the last points to ensure consistency and that we treat all banks in all countries uh, the same way. Um, what do we have in like what do we have actually available so how how do we what can we do in order to achieve the supervisory aims um, that we have so in terms of tools so of course there is an, is an SSM regulation um, and that SSM regulation gives us micro prudential but also macro prudential tools um, and it's very much on the micro prudential side that that we work in terms of tools where we have um, of course we grant and withdraw bank licenses um, we need to authorize acquisitions um, of holdings if there are M&As and so on planned by banks, then that is something which we are looking at. Um, regularly, we really assess simply the compliance with all prudential requirements that you have in place. Um, we do a lot of investigations um, and on-site inspections, which means um, I will share say a few words later on how we are overall organized. Um, but we have a separate department that really works only on on-site inspections. So these are really on-site inspectors um, and people who go most of the time they spend at banks. So that means they, um, they also have a good comparison across different institutions um, for different topics. Um, and they're really independent also of, from the normal team that supervises a bank um, in order to ensure that, uh, yeah, that we retreat here uh, banks consistent across the um, across the different countries. Um, so on-site inspections are a very important tool uh, to have because you can go very much into depth uh, and talk to the bank and question and so on. On-site inspection means uh, very concretely, I mean, you would have a team, for example, of four or five people, sometimes even up to 10 people um, going to the bank um, and talking to them, for example, for two or three months. Um, on a specific topic. They send documentation requests before and they have all kinds of meetings. In the end, they come up with a gigantic report and recommendations um, to, uh, to what is not in place or what is not good enough. And then um, together with the JST, the Joint Supervisory Team um, at the ECB, uh, we draft then uh, also short findings and recommendations that we share with the bank where we're asking them to um, remediate the shortcomings that were identified. Um, that a little bit on on-site inspections. Um, what also we do, of course, is we set prudential requirements. Um, I mean, in terms of, um, yeah, anything you can imagine to, to disclosure, also internal governance, fit and proper testing. So if the bank wants to install a new CRO, a new CEO, and those candidates are proposed, and then of course they are examined, questioned, um, screened, and, and, and then approved or not, depending. Um, so uh, those are typical tasks which we which we're carrying out. Um, the also the supervisory reviews are are quite important. I mean, we essentially work on an annual cycle. That means um, since the pillar two requirement, um, so the capital requirement that the bank needs to hold is set on an annual basis for each bank. Also, our assessment works very much annual. So that means um, we're kind of 
starting usually in summer, August, like August, many people are still on vacation, but then like September, we start um, on, uh, on the assessment and kind of conclude that assessment around uh, March, now, let's say more April, May. And then we have all kinds of approval processes. Um, and that's really getting a full overview of all the risks that the banks are running. Um, and in order to come to a conclusion of then what, what billeture requirement, uh, so capital requirement we set. Um, as I already said before, based on all kinds of investigations, interviews, um, in, uh, like say also offsite assessments we do, we can impose corrective measures or even up until to sanctions. Um, on the other hand side of the on the macro prudential tools, um, maybe also important to uh, yeah at least to mention is that there are requirements for capital buffers that can be applied, but very much this is very much a topic for the national um, supervisory authorities since macro prudential is very much still there um, on their side in order to assess to implement that. Um, here uh, to spend some words on on capital requirements. So I already mentioned before. Of course, we we set a, a P2R, so a pillar two requirement to the bank. Essentially, that means also um, what the bank needs to be needs to fulfill in terms of um, capital to hold in for um, common equity tier one, so CET one um, capital, and that CET one capital in the end, the ratio that the bank has to fulfill is calculated um, from CET one capital. No, it's essentially equity um, that the bank is holding and on the other side the risk weighted assets and when you look at the asset side for the bank um here really the point is to get a good understanding um and that is essentially our job to get an understanding or the job let's say or very much the people also specialized on on credit risk for example um to get a good understanding what the risks are running that the um or the, what the risks are to the assets that the bank is holding and um, depending on these assets, um, the bank themselves have models in place in order to calculate then the risk weight um, that they have. Some are also standardized models. Um, so we have overall then, of course, the RWA that are defined as a total sum of all um, the assets multiplied by their weight, um, such that you can come up in the end or get to the conclusion of a CET1 ratio um, that the, that bank has um, in order to, yeah understand um, how how well capitalized the bank is. I already said, I mean, I mentioned a few times now this P2R, so the pillar two requirement. Um, this is one of the so main, that these are the main thing that we decide. So pillar two requirement and the pillar two guidance, um, which is something that the ECB publishes and, and like states for each bank annually. You can also see that on the website for, for really every significant bank that we supervise. Um, However, um, I mean, all these different things, so pillar one, of course, the 4.5%, and then also the systemic buffers, um, or let's say these additional buffers that have largely decided by the national competent authorities, together with the pillar two requirement, um, in the end need to be, um, yeah, the capital or the CT1 ratio needs to be higher than all these buffer requirements. So that means the bank needs to fulfill all these requirements by sufficient CT1 capital. Um, pillar two um, capital, or let's say pillar two guidance, is something really just a guidance that we that we issue, uh, and that is very much, I think, yeah, you can see here also a little bit the difference. So pillar, the pillar two requirement P two R um, is defined uh, yearly uh, via the um, supervisory review and evaluation process. That's what I mentioned with the annual process that we have. We also call it the SREP process. Um, or the SREP process, I mean, there are different words in place, um, but that's the, the essence of the main work we do. Um, and that's really bank specific, it's legally binding and it's publicly available. Pillar two guidance is something put on top of the requirement and that's guidance being told to banks saying, okay, ideally um, it would be good if you can hold more capital um, because of this and this. And that guidance is very much determined also by the, um, by the stress sets that we're executing. There is on a biannual basis, a stress test um, initiated by the European Banking Authority, EBA, but also executed together with the ECB. And in the other years um, where the EBA is not doing a stress test, we do our own stress test um, that focused on different topics. We had the last in 2022 focused on um, really climate risk. 
and then uh, this year it's on cybersecurity. So it's also a lot of topics that are really very present, very important, and one of the priorities of the ECB. And in that regard, there is usually then a stress test design that is implemented um, and that informs the bullet two guidance. Some more insights in, in, in the SSM. So how do we really work? I already mentioned before, um, there is a member states um, participation from basically all um, 20 uh, member states that have the euro and we have very close cooperation already with Bulgaria um, other countries also part of the EU and potentially maybe joining the euro um, can also enter into this close cooperation um, if there's an agreement signed. Um, just to have some facts, I mean, I've talked a lot about on that we supervise banks and we supervise the significant institutions um, as of mid last year that were 109 um, yeah institutions so 109 banks um, with like a balance sheet of 26.4 trillion um, and that's really 80 percent of your area uh, banking assets so um, that's really the important uh, important institutions the smaller institutions um, they are supervised by the NCA still um, but of course um, we the ECB still has the mandate for the system at large so there's still practices and people working on putting in place um, sufficient guidance and so on to, in order to ensure consistency so you need to make this distinction between SI significant institutions and LSIs the less significant institutions where um, for the less significant ones the supervision is not directly with the ECB um, how do we, how is this actually financed? I mean, we're paid by the banks. So the banks are asked to submit a fee uh, annually and that is the money for which is used in order to ensure um, the supervision is there. Um, here again, exactly um, for the ECB overseeing the system as a whole, but we have direct supervision on the significant institutions on the left-hand side. And we have indirect supervision through the national authorities um, for the less significant institutions. But as mentioned, there's horizontal divisions that support and ensure consistency and, and, and the working together. What you can see here on the left hand side, the direct supervision actually works in practice really um, via joint supervisory teams. So very concretely, that means we have a team for each of these 109 banks. Um, and that means, um, for example, for a bank like Deutsche um, or also like ING or and we have you have a team of people consisting from an e from the ECB and then from the different national competent authorities where that bank is active. I'll give you a very concrete example. I'm working um, in the team um, supervising ING. So the largest Dutch bank um, and we, of course, re work very much together with the DNB. We're about uh, about eight, nine colleagues from the ECB side, the same size probably also from the DNB side, but then um, I mean, ING Group is also uh, operating in Germany and in Belgium, very big, um, but they also have a branch in uh, Spain and they're also working in Italy, which means that of course, also with the Banco d'Italia, Banco d'Espagna, we also have close cooperation. We're really in touch with them on a very regular basis. So all decisions um, and everything we impose, decide uh, whatever we do um, and ask the bank to comply with and um, also always has to be aligned with the different authorities from all these countries. So that means, I mean, for each JST, you usually have a JST coordinator. And um, so that's the boss, if you so want, for the whole team. So that's essentially then also the boss for um, the people still who are working in the NCAs. Um, of course, but they, of course, have local also hierarchical management um, and uh, especially then you can imagine how complex it becomes. You get almost like a matrix structure in order to ensure that really there's alignment uh, across across everything. So it's a lot of coordination, a lot of talking. I mean, as you can imagine on a European level, um, everybody has a bit like their own interest. There's also, of course, a lot of national interests or sometimes national senior management pushing for certain things where we from a European perspective then more say well you know overall we would not agree with that decision and um, so it's also finding compromises and negotiating and um, for me personally honestly that's what makes the job interesting and and, and cool but um, it comes with all the challenges that as, as you can imagine when you want to find um, yeah European compromises and solutions. Um, 
so shortly on the criteria, I mean, I said um, it's 109 banks. Um, I mean, those are the criteria here overall um, that, um, yeah, that uh, are applied in order to define if an institution is significant or not. Um, very important, we really have even for the, let's say, smaller countries where or the countries where the banks are smaller, um, we also always have three banks from each uh, country. So, for example, so countries like Portugal, um, where banks are, are smaller, and they're still the three biggest banks of Portugal are supervised um, by, by the ECB. And this is a little bit to explain you really how, how does the ECB look like? So how does the distribution of work in the ECB work? And you have on the left hand side um, everything which is directly talking to the bank. So um, the three departments um, contain the um, joint supervisory teams. Um, I'm working in DG SIP or uh, DG Systemic and International Banks because ING is a really it's a international systemic bank, um, which means that uh, that falls into this department um, and uh, and therefore you have this on the left hand side on the right hand side um, of course we have a horizontal line supervision so these are really experts for the different um, risk areas that support develop um, certain methodologies review processes um, in order to yeah to ensure then when when certain assessments are rolled out across several institutions to ensure one uh, harmonization the SSR is essentially second line so um, the second line review that that are reviewing um, and, and making sure that we become better and issue core recommendations um, OMI is the on-site department I already talked about on-site inspections where there's a lot of resources and staff um, really working on that um, and then the secretariat and governance that really takes care um, also on really enforcement sanctions these processes fit and proper processes which are quite standardized um, and um, and also decision taking processes. I mean, with the supervisory board and, and and a lot of administrative work. So this is to give you an overview of what the different departments are that you could work in, or in order to what essentially contains uh, supervision, work is with supervision. Um, concretely, in the joint supervisory team, um, I mean, what we look at or what we supervise um, from the banks, I mean, I already said, like, we, we talk to them, mm -hmm, this is how we do it, but what do we look at? I mean, we look, of course, at the risks, so financial and the non-financial risks, um, and mainly at the categories that you see here. So also within these joint supervisory teams, you would have um, then teams really working on a specific risk area, like credit risk. Uh, internal models very related to mostly credit risk internal models, liquidity market, um, capital, business model governance, um, off risk, and quite new um, also for climate. So um, climate is still a little bit the strange animal because uh, the risks can spread out into different risk areas, um, but it is a very important topic that we're dealing with now and that receives a lot of attention. So I want to spend a few words um, also at least concretely on some topics to give you some flavor um, how that, yeah, how that looks like. <laughs> um, one topic is something that I actually started working on directly when I joined the ECB. It's something that's been around since 2014. Um, in 2014, the Basel Committee um, issued principles, which are also known as the BCBS 239. So um, that's a, a set of documents or a set of principles um, issued asking banks to really ensure that they have effective risk data aggregation and risk reporting. Because as you can imagine, I mean, any supervision of a bank or anything you do, you need to have the right data. Otherwise, um, whatever you pose a decision on um, is, is not really meaningful. So, um, and but the topic is really complicated. So, because essentially from a bank perspective, there is it's quite difficult to set the right incentives um, in order to make sure that financial institutions move in that direction. Um, many financial institutions have um, legacy systems. They have, um, they really have acquired or expanded um, maybe their network or the, the areas where they're active on, on a step-by-step -step basis. So also the IT systems, the way how data is aggregated, how reports are done um, is very fragmented and is very much, um, yeah, sometimes really based on Excel sheets, there's no complete solution, there's no complete IT uh, in place, a complete IT architecture in place. 
Um, so that was one of the reasons why in 2014, the Basel Committee said we issue these principles. And um, of course, the ECB, uh, in order to yeah, see how banks are complying with them, it was part of the supervision. So already in 17, like 16, 17, a review was done to understand where banks are standing. And you see in the in the graph here on 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 the below part, like P, P1, P2, and so on, these are different criteria um, what we, where we have expectations towards the banks. So for example, on governance, right? Like how much attention the management board pays to this topic, um, but also in terms of accuracy, integrity, how the, how the data is supposed to look like, completeness, timeliness, and more on the right-hand side, certain reports, how frequent they are supposed to be distributed and by, to whom they are supposed to be distributed. However, what we have seen and what you can see in the chart is essentially for almost all uh, expectations, uh, the progress has been really, really slow. So uh, almost to no movement. Um, and banks are spending money. There are remediation programs in place, um, but it just proves to be super difficult to get to get anything done in that area, which is part of the reason why it's also defined as, as an SSM priority um, for these years. Um, and we're really stepping up our approach. Um, there is an ECB guide, so um, so far we really had the Basel principles um, for now, which are quite high level and very, not, very much not so concrete, telling the banks what they should do. So the ECB said, okay, part of our efforts, um, we also um, will issue a certain guide where we really clarify the supervisory expectations, um, what banks are supposed to do um, and to comply with. That guide, um, the consultation phase is finished, so banks have been consulted on this. It is currently under revision from the industry and like following the industry feedback and will be published uh, in the first half of this year. Um, and that uh, really that guide provides a lot more expectations in the different areas, um, namely in these seven different areas. And that is essentially what we're really working on. So. Um, on the topic, really ensuring full responsibility of the management board, sufficient scope of the application. So if a bank has in place a data governance framework, don't just cover your main five, I don't know, risk reports, but really make it comprehensive to all material data that you have in the bank. Um, the um, data quality framework, um, a part of this, to really make sure all data have an owner, they have a, um, yeah, they have people responsible for it. There's a certain validation function, internal audit looks at it. So these are just really examples. I'm not going to go into all details, um, but on these different topics, we go talk to the bank and say, look, this is what we expect from you. Where do you stand? What have you done? Um, yes, so that is something I've been working on. We're now doing also, um, for example, part of this is, is a thematic review um, where we have a standardized methodology from the horizontal team, which we send out to the banks, where we send questionnaires to the banks, and then they come back with their answers plus supporting material that you need to assess. And then you go to the bank, talk to them again um, on uh, yeah questions we might have. And then we come to an overall conclusion where we can also impose and simply say, um, we still see shortcomings in these in these areas. Or we include also things in uh, our supervisory decisions. And that means you have a supervisory decisions. That's something that's legally binding. Um, so you can really oblige banks to comply with certain expectations until a specific date. Um, and if that is not done, then you can see, okay, what's the next escalation step in really imposing sanctions. Second topic, um, close to, yeah, like I think super important and super relevant in different areas. Um, and that is something, uh, I mean, there is a lot of controversy and I think there's also a lot of pushback, especially from the industry of why does the ECB deal with climate risk and why do we supervise even climate risk? Um, but I think it is, to me, it's almost obvious and it's really at hand to say, okay, of course, um, the changes we see um, in our environment due to climate and environmental um, topics, uh, considerations are, of course, posing a risk to the banks. So it's something that we need to look at. I mean, in the end, um, you have you have two areas. So one is the really the physical risk um, due to storms, floodings, um, like any kind of natural catastrophes that can impact, for example, housing and um, that can impact really assets that the bank has or that are securing assets that the bank is holding. Um, that's on the physical risk side, but also especially really relevant is the transition risk. I mean, so many companies are going through a transition phase 
um, at the moment or they need to invest, they need to um, change how, how production is, for example, done, how certain processes are set up. Um, and it requires simply also the banks to have an understanding where their clients are standing in order to have an idea how high the risk for that client is that they maybe don't make that transition. And that maybe, for example, at some point they cannot fulfill their obligations and pay back their loans to be very simply said. So um, these are kind of very concrete risks that the financial industry has to assess and has to know. Um, most challenges really um, is again also here data, like to have the data in place and to understand and know um, what it is. So just an example, um, like greenhouse gas emission data from corporations. I think there's no legal obligation for corporations to really um, publish that data. So also for the financial industry, they're saying, well, you know, I have a lot of clients, but like this data is not published, so I don't really have it. So they're trying to build all kinds of models in order to proxy um, the greenhouse gas emissions for certain um, sectors that they're very active in. But um, in the end, it's a start now, right? So it's a start that we're going on that they say we build models, we, we rely on some external data, some proxies that we can have available. Um, but it's really kickstarting the process. And that's why that topic is quite new. I mean, in 2000, uh, yeah, in 2020 and November, the ECB issued a, a guide with expectations what we want the financial industry to, to have in place and how we expect them to manage their CNE risks. Um, and this is also, again, here in, in, in line, so you would see in the different areas um, where we have expectations. So really on terms of business strategy, we also expect again here the management body to be on top, to set risk appetites. So really do a risk steering and incorporate it uh, in, in the risk management that the bank has is doing. Um, and uh, we're looking at these different topics via different exercises. So there's been a big thematic review um, on, on these risks in 2022. Um, in parallel with what I mentioned already, the stress test on climate risk, um, also in 2022, in order to get a good understanding where banks are standing um, related to the uh, to the expectations that we have. And I brought no, so this is a, the next slide. We'll have we'll have the outcome also of the thematic review. Um, but maybe shortly, I also want to give you um, an idea of what we're doing. So. 2020, there was the issue of the guide. 2021 was really given to the bank to say, look, now there's the guide. What are you doing? Set something in place. Assess where you stand. Do your self-assessment. So it's really starting slowly. And I think institutions have not taken it seriously. They have really kind of, many have let the 2021 year just pass um, and woke up a little bit then in 2022 um, saying, now the supervisor came and assessed all these different topics and we realized we actually do have uh, shortcomings and we haven't put enough force on it. So when they got the feedback letters done in 2022 from the thematic review and also had the outcome from the stress test, they woke up and said, look, now we need to do something. We need to set in place a specific departments dealing with it, processes in place and so on. Um, and that is essentially what we've been seeing in 2023 was many banks really working on huge remediation programs to address all the shortcomings that they were that we told them in 2022 um, and we're now really working on the follow-up of these findings so um, findings that we issued or shortcomings that we told them that they have where they're now coming back saying this is what we have put in place um, and and this is how we changed our processes in order uh, to address the finding and we're now seeing with them, is this sufficient or not? And if it is not sufficient, how we can escalate further. Um, that is a little bit the roadmap that we have. Um, and to give you an idea also where banks are standing overall, I mean, you see here each institution is, is one blue dot. Um, and um, in terms of comprehensiveness, so we look at how comprehensive the practices are, but also how sound these practices are, so how good enough. Um, you can really see that there's there's really room for improvement. Um, I mean, it is also not the case that it is very, very bad and that they're really only red flags. So there's a lot of institutions that have done something that have good practices or, or in some areas only really just minor gaps uh, in place, but it is the majority of the pack can definitely still move much more towards the upper right corner. Um, and um, it's, this is especially relevant in light of the fact that also really 80% of institutions concluded that the risks that they have is really materially impacting their strategy. So we also asked them, 
first before you know you manage the risk have an idea how big is it even so how like how much affected are you by it by climate and environmental risks um and that is it is really important to banks i think even by their own assessment they they come to that conclusion so it's something they should have an own interest in looking at um it just comes with all the challenges that i mentioned um so here um, we have the remediation timelines of what I mentioned before, really by end of 2024, end of this year, we expect all banks to be compliant or to fulfill the supervisory expectations outlined in the guide um, from, from 2020. Um, I mean, we're in January, so there's still a few months down the road, but um, yeah, I think it will. it's definitely a challenge to the whole industry um, uh, overall to really get the practices here up to, up to standard. A few words on, and I, I look at the time, yeah, I'll spend two, three, two, three minutes just on the traineeships, but then I'm also happy to, to answer questions if this is of interest to some of you. Um, of course, I'm, I'm pretty sure David also can make available my email address if somebody wants to come back personally. Um, if you're interested, I'm also happy to do that. Um, so overall in, in, in the ECB, I think um, the, the easiest or the normal way to enter, um, what most people do is buy a traineeship, essentially an internship. I mean, we call it traineeship, but it's essentially an internship. Um, and it offers you like practical experience, learning and whatever. Um, I think what is also important maybe to mention what you need to bring um, like I think there's not in terms of really background uh, from studying there's not really of course it's beneficial if you have a background in finance um, or you understand the banking sector have experience there but also we have people from from very different areas like also lawyers um, sociologists um, people who have experience in different areas so for sure um, just take a chance if you're interested just apply um, uh, what I think is important, but I would expect most of you also have that, is that you have uh, English and then another um, another language, at least B1, besides your mother tongue, um, and in terms of language requirements. Um, the yeah recruitment. I mean, it's an online application, and a shortlisting. There's a there's an interview um, where you which you have to prepare. In the interview, they ask you a lot also of of your motivation, and then. You know, um, what risks, for example, you see, I remember they asked me, for example, what risks do you see for the for the uh, industry at the moment? Or where do you see this overall? So to simply have an idea, if you have an idea of, of the financial industry. Um, you can actually get paid. So I think that's also good. And, and not all uh, public institutions pay you for internships. <laughs> so um, most contracts are done for for six months, but they can be extended to up to one year. So one year is really the limitation um, on, on, on doing this internship. Um, and then, but the ECB also has something like a graduate program. So you can afterwards also apply to a graduate program, which are several years then in different departments across the ECB. Um, and, uh, or you apply then also for an, yeah, an entry level position. Um, that's what I did. Um, you see, we rely a lot on trainees, so um, they're actually really important. A lot of work, uh, a lot of really good work, um, is done is done by them. So I think um, we couldn't do it without. Um, and I think every team almost has a, has a trainee. So um, and they that's because we were so reliant on them. And you really thrown in first day uh, full with with tasks. So it's not like uh, you get kind of like a lot of administrative tasks, but you really get to to do a lot of things. Um, uh, and go to the bank like I think and in the beginning it was really interesting you you meet the CEO or the CRO of the bank and you prepare these meetings and you can raise your questions there so in terms of being quite junior uh, and having that exposure and that experience really is cool um, is cool to have um, yeah that's what I mentioned already before so um, afterwards you apply either for entry level positions or there's also the possibility to have something what we call a short term contract um, and that's also up to one year there's a limit on that and these short term contracts are really additional budget that divisions have available to give out contracts to cover for example maternity leave parental leave people or people being on sabbatical um, so that depends on what budget might be available in a division that you're working in or that you're interested in. Yes, so um, that was 
what I want to share from my side. I'm, I'm very happy uh, for any questions and also looking forward to, to the discussions and, uh, and what, uh, what they want to share. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Caroline.